Hi everyone, my name is Neil Lewis Jr. and I wanna thank you for joining us for part two of the Sioux Park Virtual Symposium on making changes to improve our field. Hopefully you were able to see um, part one in which four scholars reflected on the historical makeup of our discipline and its methodological practices and what that's meant for the knowledge we've created thus far. This session builds on those reflections by asking for additional speakers who have been leading reforms in our field to share their thoughts on what we can do to create a more diverse, methodologically rigorous, and socially responsive discipline. Oyan Sayed has been studying the implications of open science and other methodological reforms for ethnic minority psychology and broader diversity within the field. Alison Ledgerwood has spent the past few years working on methods and practices to improve, to make our science both, both more open and inclusive. Miguel Salan is a metapsychologist who's been studying the implications of cross-cultural differences for the design of multi-site studies and other large-scale collaborations, which have been growing in our field. And Ivy Onieto has both been conducting research on processes that perpetuate group-based disparities, as well as building initiatives to address those disparities in our field. I'm excited to hear from each speaker about the lessons they've learned from their work and what it means for moving the field forward. And I thank you all for joining us. At this time, I'll turn it over to Moin to get us started. Hello, everyone. I'm Moin Syed from the University of Minnesota. I'm very pleased to be kicking off this symposium today, and big thanks to Neil for the invitation. As you can see from the title of my talk, I'm not going to be particularly positive towards social psychology today. I hope that you will take my critical comments in the spirit that they were intended rather than reacting defensively to them. The intention is that we can hopefully make things better, which we all need to do in a number of domains, um, but in particular today, what I'm focusing on is the area of diversity. Of course, thinking about improving diversity uh, within the field is quite complex and can't be boiled down to a singular factor, but because I only have 10 minutes today, I'm going to pretend like we can, and that is experiments. Now, the social psychology's focus on experiments has been critiqued quite a bit in the literature, but mostly in terms of issues of external validity, the degree to which the lab-based experiments can generalize to the, quote, real world. I'm taking a somewhat different angle here and making two very general points. One is that the emphasis on experiments in the field restricts diversity within social psychology, and that the emphasis on experiments is scientifically unjustifiable. So we're engaging in a practice uh, that is both uh, harmful to the makeup of the field, but also harmful to the science as a whole. Now, it's important in making these points to know a little bit of history about the experimental focus of social psychology. Uh, not long ago, there wasn't so much a difference between social psychology and sociology, but social psychologists became increasingly interested in conducting lab-based experiments. And as they did, conducting experiments focusing more on the micro context of behavior, that became the emphasis within the field, whereas sociology focused more on the structural, broader social macro context text factors. Now, hopefully you have your causal inference brain on and you're wondering if the direction of causation goes somewhat differently and is more substantive that social psychologists became interested in the immediate micro context, which then lent itself to conducting lab-based experiments and then went from there. That is totally plausible and makes a lot of sense, but is also fairly inconsistent with the historical record. Rather, it seems that there was a, a real keen interest in conducting lab-based experiments, which then led to the focus on the micro context because that's what can be studied more easily in a lab context versus the structural factors. Now, why would this interest uh, arise? Why this intense focus on experiments? Well, it's likely because of our old friend, physics envy. At that time, around World War II and now, uh, social psychologists and psychologists in general um, were a little self-conscious about their status within the field, wanting to be taken seriously as a real science. Right? And so they looked to those who are considered real sciences, the natural sciences, and their heavy focus on experimentation. And so uh, if, if social psychologists could emulate this approach that might increase their status and the, and, the, and the perception amongst other scientists and the public at large, that they are engaging in real science. However, uh, it's quite clear that if, 
your, your the way you approach any psychological question is thinking, how do I fit it into an experiment? And even more narrowly, perhaps, how do I fit it in a two by two experiment? It's just a fact that you're necessarily restricting yourself from the broader universe of possible and interesting questions, social, psychological, and otherwise, that you could pursue. And in particular, these are the kinds of questions that might be especially of interest um, to minority researchers who are getting into the field. Uh, one of my mentors, Dr. Linda Zhuang, um, she got into psychology because she was interested in understanding more about why she was engaging in conflict with her immigrant parents when she was an adolescent. That is not the kind of topic that lends itself to so much to a lab-based experiment. And accordingly, she went instead to developmental psychology, uh, where those kinds of questions can be pursued. And what we see now is there's really a thriving diversity science within developmental psychology, focusing on topics of identity, acculturation, discrimination, uh, socialization, schooling, all that were really, really driven heavily by minority scholars informed by their personal experiences, but then turned into rigorous uh, uh, forms of scientific inquiry. So this real heavy focus on, on experimentation might be pushing away some of the very students that the field is hoping to uh, attract. Now, you may say to yourself, of course, social psychology studies topics of racism, discrimination, prejudice, all kinds of topics that minority researchers would be interested in. And that is true. However, when they do, they overwhelmingly uh, study them for, from what's often referred to as the perpetrator's perspective, from for the white perspective. So even when studying diversity-related topics in social psychology, the perspective of the majority is being privileged. And interestingly, according to the data from Roberts et al., that perspective is true whether the researchers themselves are white or researchers of color, suggesting that it's a field-wide kind of focus, a framework of how social psychology of diversity is carried out. Now, why would this be the case? Of course, it's important to examine perpetrators and all actors and those who are involved within the field of diversity, but why such an intense focus on white participants? Well, yes, I believe it's experiments. Uh, most of these studies are lab-based experiments conducted in university settings, and so they require uh, participants, subjects who are nearby, and nearby tends to be college students. There's a reason why Arnett suggested that JPSB be renamed the Journal of the Personality and Social Psychology of American Undergraduate Introductory Psychology Students. Now, it is the case that universities are much more diverse than we often give credit for, but there's still a relatively small pool to draw from if you're only focusing on lab based experiments. So in all, it seems quite clear to me that the methods are driving the substantive focus of the field, both in terms of how the questions are asked, fitting it into the experiments, and then the specific nature of the design, focusing on the perpetrator, the majority view, all to sort of fit the project study into an experimental paradigm rather than driving with a substantive question that then leads to um, a particular method. But experiments, you say, experiments, these, this is the bread and butter of science, right? Causal, causal relations, what's more scientific than that? And I'll tell you what's more scientific than that, asking good questions and designing studies that address those questions in the best way possible. Right? Rather than having a method first leading to a question, you have a question leading to a method. We can broadly think of the steps in science as consisting of observation, description, explanation, prediction, and control. Uh, that each of these steps really uh, relies on the previous and you build upon each other to get more in-depth knowledge about a particular topic and in a particular field. Social psychology is heavily rooted at the explanation phase focusing on testing hypotheses, developing theories, trying to establish causal, causal relations among constructs. This is where the vast majority of attention is paid. But this is highly problematic because almost no attention is paid to the observation and description phases. So what's happening then is the attempt to try to understand causal relations amongst constructs that we simply do not understand. And that's not going to end well, and we're seeing that that's not ending well. So what we see is the, the focus on experimentation really provides kind of a smokescreen that hides some other more problematic practices. Yes, you're conducting a rigorous science-based experiment, but having only 10 white participants per cell is not really getting the job done. 
So what this looks like to me is more about playing science, sort of appealing to what science is supposed to look like. Again, going back to that history of trying to raise the status by having a strong focus on experimentation, playing science rather than doing science, of asking good questions and having carefully designed studies, no matter what method that might be. And the influence of physics MV just continues to really um, infiltrate all ways of thinking, not just in social psychology and all areas of psychology, but especially in the experimental focus of social psychology. So at this point, I asked the question, what is the risk to diversifying methods? Why not? Where has the strong focus on experimental methods really gotten us? Thinking about all the issues that are brought up in yesterday's symposium and that will be discussed in today's and over the last decade in the wake of the replication crisis and the open science movement, the strong focus on experimental methods has not brought the accumulated uh, knowledge that we all hoped it would. So why not try something else? Why not be more open? to conducting qualitative and mixed method studies, to generating more rigorous, deeper knowledge about the topics that we're all so passionate about studying. And the only answer that I can come up with for why not is status, the focus on hierarchy, the idea that experiments and conducting experiments accrues or confers some kind of status marker that indicates that we're doing real science. And that in itself is not doing real science. The focus on experiments is not good for science. It's not good for diversity. We really need to be thinking about how we can expand our toolbox and focus on questions and tailoring designs to those questions. I'll close by talk, mentioning that uh, when I first heard about SPSB, I was told that the P for personality is silent. Um, I find the dynamic between social and personality to be odd and quite troubling, actually. It's this explicit hierarchy in the field that nobody is really ashamed of uh, verbalizing out loud. It's just out there in the open. And uh, indeed, uh, social psychology has a hierarchy problem. All areas of psychology and science do, but social psychology in particular does, focusing on rising stars and superstars, um, celebrity encounters at conferences, uh, overemphasizing one uh, overrated journal as being the, the premier outlet where all the important science is being published. Again, none of this is good for science and none of this is good for diversity. So as the society in the field is thinking about how to engage in different initiatives to improve diversity in the field, uh, one of the important targets needs to be this hierarchical nature and try to de-emphasize the status-based approach to science. And one way to do that is downplaying the role of experiments. Experiments are important, we should be doing experiments, but bring down their role in the hierarchy. Thank you very much. Comments, questions, complaints, rotten tomatoes, whatever you want, you can send. Thanks for listening. Hi, everyone. I'm going to talk to you a little today about a paper that I had the opportunity to work on with these amazing folks here. And in this paper, we call on psychological scientists to reimagine our discipline as fundamentally open and inclusive. We wrote this paper because there's a lot of interest in improving our discipline. Many psychological scientists can imagine a future that's better than the present. So for example, the open science movement, both within and beyond the borders of our field is motivated for many people by the desire to enable anyone who wants to participate in science to do so, to make scientific process and output transparent to everyone and to dismantle the hierarchy and entrenched power structures that privilege seniority and insider status. Meanwhile, scientists have been pushing for change in academia for a long time along what are often considered separate, distinct avenues, like confronting systemic racial inequities and increasing racial diversity, and confronting systemic gender inequity and um, the underrepresentation of women in STEM. But scientists pushing for change along each of these individual avenues would be the first to tell you that progress has been slow and difficult. And we argue that progress is slow and maybe even doomed to fail because these aren't actually independent separate avenues. They're more like interlocking puzzle pieces. Now to understand why these are like puzzle pieces that interlock, we have to understand our history. 
If we don't do that, if we instead ignore history and just focus on what's happening right now in our institutions, we might try to reform science by say building or strengthening diversity initiatives that are designed to increase the pipeline of underrepresented group members. And that's great, but it's incomplete and it will not work on its own because when somebody does get through that pipeline, they're going to encounter a system that definitely wasn't designed for them. And it wasn't designed with replicability or generalizability or transparency in mind either. And so in our paper, we argue that any attempt to reform science, to change where we're going, has to start by examining where we've been. That is, to shape the future, we have to understand where we are now. And to understand where we are now, we have to look at the past, at how we came to be this way. So what happens when we do that, when we consider history? We see that the academy was built by and for whom? For affluent, cis, straight, white men in Western democratic societies. So for example, many universities in the US were designed to educate wealthy white men to be contributing members of society. Science as we know it has both formally and informally excluded anyone who wasn't white or a man for centuries. And our modern institutions were largely created by and for white men. So perhaps not surprisingly then, these men created a culture that catered to their own experiences and needs and values. A culture that then overrepresents and overvalues the experiences and perspectives and needs of white, Western, cis, male people. The problem is that a culture that caters to and prioritizes the needs and values and experiences of a small subset of people is also going to exclude and devalue everyone else. And this exclusion contorts and diminishes all aspects of our sciences. It restricts the diversity of identities and perspectives that are held by people who enter the field. It burdens people who persist in the face of exclusion and reject systemic changes that would ease their path. It legitimizes practices that hoard scientific knowledge so that not everyone can access it. It deprioritizes and delegitimizes research questions and course topics that depart from the dominant viewpoint. And it undervalues all participant perspectives outside of those reflecting a very narrow slice of the human population. And we're left with a culture that looks something like this. So historically, the path to scientific discovery was and continues to be defined as a competitive and individual pursuit of knowledge. If two scientists are working on the same question, it's a race to see who can get there first. Or in tenure letters or award decisions, you're often asked to compare, explicitly asked to compare an individual against other members of the pool or cohort to, to say who is doing the best. The sharing of ideas and resources and data has traditionally been discouraged. Ideas are something we're supposed to hoard so that someone else doesn't get credit for our idea, our discovery. And you don't collect a data set, right? And then immediately share it with the world before you've published from it because then you wouldn't get any credit for just sharing the data. Even if it then enabled a flurry of scientific discoveries that catapulted forward the field. And as a final example, success is traditionally measured as individual output, like number of publications, number of citations, rather than, for example, collective output or contributions to a scientific system. But it doesn't have to be this way, right? There are other ways that science could be set up. So we could define the path to scientific discovery as a collaborative and collective pursuit of knowledge we could explicitly encourage and value in our incentive systems, the sharing of ideas and data and resources. And we could be measuring success as the quality of a researcher's processes or as collective output rather than individual output. So we happen to have the culture that's on the left here rather than something else. And, and that shouldn't be surprising given our history, who our institutions were designed to cater to. But it is problematic because it leads to a system where we have a replicability crisis, a generalizability crisis, rampant inequity, and a generally very precarious system of doing science. Again, the point here is that different systems of inclusion and exclusion in science are interlocking. You can't pull on the thread of sexism without also addressing racism. 
You can't make science more open without thinking about and addressing what keeps it closed. We have to address the fabric, not the individual threads. So how do we do that? We need to reimagine and reinvent our incentive systems. Our paper provides a very concrete roadmap for how to do this, but I'll just illustrate here with a few examples at different levels of intervention. So at the level of a department or university, imagine if instead of bean counting publications and grant dollars for hiring and promotion decisions, we started evaluating quality of process. Like if science is a building, we evaluate the quality of the processes that are used to construct that building rather than just how tall is the building in isolation without thinking about anything else. Or instead of soliciting letters that focus on individual research output, we could solicit and ourselves write letters for tenure and promotion decisions that assess inclusive excellence and contributions to science as a system. At the level of our journals, imagine if instead of only publishing traditional papers, high impact journals also published open data sets that could themselves make a substantial contribution to advancing cumulative and collective knowledge. So no paper, no result section, just a carefully collected and curated data set that enables other researchers to make discoveries, but it counts as a top tier publication. Or imagine if instead of handling manuscripts always in the order that they're received, journals started fast tracking papers from junior and or underrepresented authors to push that research forward faster through the process. And at the level of our professional societies, imagine if instead of awards for individual achievements or star researchers, we started giving awards for constellations of researchers and for collaborations. Or if instead of relegating diversity issues to one particular committee, as if it's a specific concern that can be adequately addressed separately from everything else a society is doing, what if we baked these kinds of considerations into every aspect of how our societies function? So these are just a handful of specific examples, but I actually think imagining is a really important part of this process, you know, just starting to notice, if we aren't already, the default assumptions that we make about what is valuable, what is the right way to do things. Start questioning those assumptions and start to imagine alternatives. And then if you have decision-making power, decision-making input yourself, or if you can collectively mobilize with other people, you can formalize that process. You can work in your department or university or professional societies to engage in strategic planning around the goal of reimagining our incentive systems. So again, we offer a concrete roadmap for how to do this in our paper, so check it out. And then decide, will you act now? The pandemic, we think creates both a particular urgency and a particular opportunity to take bold and sweeping action here, but it's on us. It won't happen unless we make it happen. So let's do this, you, me, us, let's go. Thank you. Good day, everyone. We know that psychology has a weird problem. We are feel that with this weird samples weird researchers, and even weird approaches. This recognition of the weird problem and the threat that it presents to generalizable psychological knowledge is why large-scale collaboration, multi-site studies, and cross-cultural studies have been advocated for in the recent years. But when we think of a common cross-cultural large-scale collaboration in psychology, it is typically in this form. A proposing team develops a standard set of instruments, experimental conditions, stimuli, and so on. And using the network, these are then translated to multiple languages and then sent to labs across multiple countries for data gathering. It is aimed to be as standard as possible across sites. Of course, this is a massive simplification. Between steps, there's a whole lot of hard work and effort, but mostly it follows this manner and is in a way a top-down approach. What I'd like to do for this talk is to present another way of thinking about multi-site studies, and that starts with a few stories on the ground. Those working in developing countries or developing areas in a developed country know that there are particular social realities that we encounter when we do psychological science on the ground. For example, when you go to a community like this to study, people would crowd around you when you start to gather your data. And you can hardly pluck these individuals out to meet experimental laboratories in a university miles and miles away. When you go to a place such as this, for example, where illiteracy is very prevalent, you can hardly give them a Likert type scale or an online experiment 
or when you go to our rural provinces the Philippines and you ask a question like this, for example, you might get an unexpected answer. How they use concepts as seemingly basic as timekeeping may not be similar to how you would use a concept. The social realities of these spaces often prevent us from using methods that are mainstream in social psychology. Now, this, this is exactly why the indigenous psychology was born. Indigenous psychology is a movement in psychology that aims to understand people with an approach that takes into account their cultural realities, including their language and how they make sense of the world, for example, how they make sense of time, to understand individual behavior, thought, and affect. It was developed as a counter movement to what was naively see, to what was seen as a naively assumed universalism of Western psychology. Now, there's a whole degree worth to talk about this, but we're introducing indigenous psychology because it provides another way of thinking about the path to generalizable psychology. Here, the, the path to generalizable psychological knowledge is through the comparison of locally developed phenomena, concepts, and mechanisms that account for the respective psychological, social, and cultural realities. It would look something like this, for example, where a local phenomena is conceptualized, data is gathered, it is analyzed through the indigenous lens in one site and another and another, and only then is it compared across different sites. And so it's a largely bottom-up procedure. For example, the folk realities of the Philippines is a source of the concept of Kapwa, Various studies gather data for this, try to validate the concept and analyze it. And similarly for Ubuntu and Pan-African countries, and this can be extended to other societies, for example. And there are multiple independent explorations before it is compared, which is basically looking into how a particular social cognition affects social behavior and relationship maintenance. Of course, this is way different from the earlier top-down cross-cultural approach that we saw a while ago. Another way to contrast these two is to look at the role of culture. In the cross-cultural approach, culture is treated as an external variable that causes variability in behavior, while in the cross-indigenous approach, culture is treated as co-constitutive of the individual, or in some important manner, within the individual. Another contrast is in the goals of the cross-cultural enterprise, which is to test the generality of existing theories by comparing the responses of differing cultural groups on standardized measures of psychological processes, while the goal of the cross-indigenous approach is to converge or fail to converge on universals through multiple independent explorations among source cultures. Now, why are we bothering with this cross-indigenous approach in the first place? With the way psychologists typically do cross-cultural studies, these studies are vulnerable to three things. One is that it can put weird situations to non-weird populations. Two, it strongly assumes equivalence and comparability across sites. And three, these errors or vulnerabilities may then remain undetected, and we'll talk about them in turn. For example, as reviewed by Feldman Barrett 2017, when Paul Ekman and team presented a stimuli like this to the Fourier tribe of the Papua New Guinea, of course, with the emotion terms translated, the four people were able to match the facial expression with a quote-unquote correct emotion term. However, when this method was changed, making the participants freely label the same facial expression, there was no forced choice, no Western source structure of response, the match between facial expression and again, quote-unquote, correct emotion term plummets. And studies like these cast doubt on the foundations of claiming that there are six universal basic emotion categories. What we're highlighting here is that common cross-cultural approaches is vulnerable to putting weird situations to non-weird populations. These weird situations and the methodological artifacts that they then produce then gets baked into the data that we gather and that we analyze and so to the conclusions that we hold. We only have 10 minutes, so we don't really have time to really delve deep into this. But another vulnerability of cross-cultural studies is its strong assumption of comparability and equivalence. Standardized cross-cultural approaches initially assume comparability, else why would you do the study in the first place? 
they have the assumption of construct equivalence that what we are measuring in one country is also the same thing that we're measuring in another and another and another. It may or may not be assessed, but when assessed, this is usually done through measurement in various approaches. Another assumption is that of a causal factor equivalence, that the causal factor that we isolate in one experiment is the same that we isolate in another, in another, and another country. There is an assumed consistency of the causal factor across sites. Again, this may or may not be assessed, but when assessed, it is usually through manipulation checks. Now, one issue that we encounter here is that equivalence assessments are usually done downstream at the stage of analysis and not so much in the stage of conceptualization. There are many issues that we face. For example, we're not even sure if the latent variable model, which is the foundation of the measurement invariance analysis, is a good model to fit for many psychological constructs. Further, claims of equivalence need causal accounts and not just statistical accounts. Unfortunately, the measurement models that we often use, like CFA and SEM, as between-person models are actually quite hard to interpret causally. It may be the case that we need to focus on things beyond downstream assessments of equivalence. And what we're also concerned about is that these vulnerabilities or these errors may then be hard to detect especially again, once it's already baked into the data that we get, for example, as forced choice responses to Likert type scales in experiments. And this is also doubly hard to uncover without gathering, quali gathering qualitative data. So can the cross indigenous approach remedy common cross-cultural vulnerabilities? Well, we hope so, that we are able to stake out what are unique what are shared and what are universal across populations and cultures with no a priori expectation of comparability across sites. And this can come in different varieties. For example, in designing measures, instead of one standardized instrument common cross-cultural approaches, one can do an instrument assembly that there is a multiple teams creating multiple versions of each test, each of which are culturally appropriate and this can be thought of as multiple operationalizations of the same construct and probing whether at all this construct exists for the particular culture. Also, one can do a sensitivity analysis with the both the standardized version and each of the culturally appropriate local version. In terms of data gathering, the cross indigenous variants include qualitative, ethnographic, indigenous, and other mixed method approaches. And for example, one can imagine doing a multiple concurrent ethnographies in multiple sites with some broad standard instruction. For the analysis, meanwhile, instead of one central team doing the uh, data analysis, as is the case for cross-cultural approaches, there can be several rounds of analysis. It can be, for example, in the first round that local data are analyzed by local teams, and it's only later on in the analysis pipeline that there is actually a comparison across these sites. And we might find out, for example, that it doesn't make sense to compare. So unlike the cross-cultural approach, which compares early or compares first, here we compare late or compare last. Generally, we are asking, how can we get as close to naturalistic behavior, thinking, and feeling how can we match our methods and data gathering to reflect uh, to their social, uh, social reality? Would it be possible to triangulate? And is there low, solid enough local exploration, description, development, or validation to warrant comparison across other cultures? And I'd like to end this presentation with a quote by Estudian Block that therefore the solution cannot be as suggested by Henry Jeff Alton, Mr. Studies upon Studies to the billions of poor people around the world who remain on tap by the behavioral sciences. The solution is far more complicated and costly. It requires an un often uncomfortable compromise between internal validity and general generality, and a lot more detailed ethnographic work that many seem willing to accept. Only in this way will data from non-weird populations become a meaningful and indispensable ingredient of any general theory about our species. This cross-indigenous approach has been dreamed of before, now and again, here and there, but with the advent of a globally collaborative psychology like the Psychological Science Accelerator, I believe that the possibility is ready and exciting for a cross-indigenous study to contribute towards a truly 
generalizable psychology. And it is time for more inconvenient research. For more details, you can go to this link. And that ends my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you all for joining us today. And thanks to those speakers for their enlightening talks. My name is Ivy Onyato, and my talk today is entitled Beyond Implicit Bias, Insights for Improving Diversity in Social and Personality Psychology. My remarks are based in part on an article with a similar title that's in press right now, co-authored with Kira Hudson and Neil Lewis. The accepted version is available on my website. In that paper, we marshal some of the research from our field to help organizational leaders and policymakers go beyond implicit bias trainings in their efforts to increase diversity and foster inclusion in their organizations. I believe that some of the insights we offer there are useful for our field as well. This is the SPSB demographic data over the last five years. Native Americans are so underrepresented that they are listed at 0% for most of the years on the SPSB website. Asians are better represented, though data on feelings of inclusion would be useful here to get a full picture. Black people have made up two to 4% of our society over the last five years. And in academia more broadly, little to no progress has been made over decades in increasing the proportion of black faculty members. These issues don't just plague our field, they exist for all sorts of competitive fields and opportunities. In an attempt to address these issues and other disparities, our field has offered the phenomenon of implicit bias. Implicit biases are automatically activated associations that reflect prejudice or stereotypes. The idea is that implicit bias can negatively affect decision making and behavior towards members of stigmatized groups. Many researchers and advocates point to implicit bias as an explanation for why disparities persist despite an ostensible warming of attitudes towards various stigmatized groups. Many of us provide implicit or unconscious bias trainings in our institutions or for companies and other organizations. Thus, implicit bias is increasingly used to explain ongoing diversity and inclusion challenges. But in our piece, we argue that organizations need to move beyond this framing as we work to produce full inclusion of racial minorities and other marginalized groups. Many high profile institutions um, have um, put in place diversity trainings in the wake of racist incidents. However, recent findings from our field raise challenges for this approach because implicit bias is resistant to change. First, a comparative examination of several implicit bias interventions found that only eight of 17 were significantly reduced implicit bias. Even amongst those that were effective, changes in implicit bias faded after 24 hours. Further, change in implicit bias is not associated with change in explicit bias or discriminatory behavior. And finally, diversity trainings generally do not affect implicit or explicit bias in the long term. And so these findings raise the question, why do we focus so much on implicit bias? Some practitioners prefer to focus on implicit and unconscious biases during diversity trainings because, for instance, white people are often defensive about allegations of racism. And so the idea is that attributing ongoing disparities to implicit bias over which people have limited control and awareness should mitigate that defensiveness. However, whites also respond defensively to information indicating that they have or even might have implicit racial bias. And beyond defensiveness, when asked to take responsibility for their implicit bias, those who are low in the motivation to respond without prejudice, who might be important targets for our interventions, actually express more explicit bias um, and are less likely to donate to black organizations. Perhaps most concerningly, in some of my work, we found that when incidents of discrimination are framed in terms of implicit rather than explicit bias, observers believe discrimination is less intentional and they're less willing to punish perpetrators of discrimination. And so together, these findings raise questions about how central implicit bias should be in our approach to diversity, equity, and inclusion challenges. So while implicit bias has been an important discovery, given these issues, we may want to move beyond framing disparities and discrimination in terms of implicit bias and implement interventions based on the following insights. Uh, we should use trainings to educate people about bias and how it manifests 
about the extent of racial disparities and about organizational efforts to address diversity, equity, and inclusion. As we're doing these trainings, we should prepare for rather than accommodate defensive responses from our colleagues or from attendees in our trainings. An institution should implement structures that uh, foster organizational responsibility for diversity, equity, and inclusion goals. So as I set up, a common response when uh, diversity challenges arise is to call for diversity training. By some estimates, companies spend $8 billion on diversity training, and these trainings often focus on implicit or unconscious bias. A recent review of diversity trainings finds that participants do successfully learn the concepts that are taught. And this review found that diversity trainings are more effective when they're implemented alongside other diversity initiatives like mentoring programs. However, diversity trainings in general have limited, if any, utility for increasing the underrepresentation of people of color and can result in defensiveness and feelings of inclusion amongst whites. So it's likely that trainings will continue and that we social psychologists will continue to offer them. But as we do so, it's important that we recast diversity trainings in light of what they actually can do, educate and raise awareness about bias and strategies for change. In a recent article in Behavioral Science and Policy, Evelyn Carter, Neil Lewis, and I offer guidelines for organizations that want to produce effective evidence-based diversity trainings. Um, beyond informing about bias, trainings can also inform attendees about the extent of group-based disparities. Um, in some of my work, we find that people vastly overestimate economic equality between whites and people of color in general. In this figure, the red diamonds represent the actual ratio of black wealth to white wealth since 1963, ranging from $5 of black wealth for every $100 of white wealth uh, to $10 of black wealth for every $100 of white wealth. And the black dots are perceptions of this ratio across the same time period. And you can see that people vastly overestimate the amount of wealth equality and also see progress where there's been very little. Similarly, in our field, Perhaps as a result of high profile black social psychologists, many probably have no clue about the extent of and persistence of racial underrepresentation and the interventions and commitments required to improve those numbers. In light of the challenges of framing these things in terms of implicit bias, it might be more useful for trainings to educate attendees about current diversity metrics, about goals for ultimate representation and concrete plans for addressing both representation and inclusion. When we inform people about the extent of disparities, there are myriad defensive responses that can emerge. In one of my research, recent papers, we report an attempt to help white people be more accurate about the lack of progress towards racial economic equality between blacks and whites. Some participants read about the persistence of discrimination, whereas others read a control article about left-handedness. While reading about the persistence of discrimination did indeed reduce overestimates of progress towards equality, it wasn't because they were more accurate about contemporary equality. Those overestimates did not change. If instead, it was because after reading about persistent racism, white participants tended to overestimate economic inequality in the past even more. And so that together uh, produced lower progress estimates. We might see this the same defensive dynamics in our own field as we raise the fact that there's been little progress in racial di diversity amongst faculty. In fact, high profile social psychologists have claimed that we as a field are good in terms of race, uh, racial representation, and instead need to focus on increasing the representation of political conservatives. It's clear from the data that I presented earlier that we're not good on racial representation. Um, and, and rather than attempting to accommodate these sort of defensive responses, we should prepare for them perhaps by marshalling the accurate data about how little progress has been made and how far we have to go, um, and or by reiterating our commitment to diversifying our field and following that commitment up with concrete action. Um, addressing individuals has its limits. So in the piece, we offer suggestions of several organizational structural interventions that can be implemented to address diversity, equity, and inclusion. But because of limited time, I'll focus on one today that's near and dear to my heart, organizational groups for underrepresented members. Um, as a department level of example, uh, example, the psychology department at UCLA has a group called UGSP, Underrepresented Graduate Students in Psychology. Um, 
I was a part of this group and we offered programming like monthly brown bag seminars with underrepresented faculty and postdocs so that we could get a sense of varying paths to the professoriate. We did outreach to high school undergraduate and transfer student populations so that we could do our part to fill the pipeline. And we hosted social events to provide connection and social support. I know that other departments like the psychology department at University of Michigan have even more specific affinity groups for Asian, Black, Latinx, and LGBTQ students. Unfortunately though, not all departments and programs have a critical mass of underrepresented students, postdocs, or faculty, although this should be the goal. And so three years ago, we cap capitalized on the informal connections and networking that happens each year at SPSB, where we do have critical mass, to institute the Black Social Psychologist Retreat. Early career scholars gather after SPSB to share resources, build community, and get feedback on research with the aim of producing more Black faculty in social and personality psychology. I'm happy to report that many of our participants have secured postdocs and faculty positions. And further, several other groups have started their own affinity retreats. Um, and there's now a specific retreat for faculty of color. In closing, my hope is that our field uh, can be full of these people and more, um, and that these people can secure faculty positions should they choose. If we have any hope of achieving such a goal of radically increasing the number of underrepresented faculty members in social and personality psychology, we have to take bold and decisive action immediately and in the long term. I hope you all will join the effort. Thank you to my co-authors, to my accountability group, my research assistants, and to all of you for your interest and attention.